Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe believe. this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. So let's start out by putting up graphic number one. And I want to clear up something today that has just really been uh, debated on the internet and in religious circles, and that is the, the rapture of the church and whether there actually is a rapture and is it just another word for the second coming? And, and there's just, as somebody that studied the word all my life, and, uh, you know, I can't speak ancient Greek, but I can sure read it and translate it. And, and I live with somebody who studies the Hebrew and, and, and studied this for years. And I'm going to tell you right now, just as before we even start, that the rapture of the church is biblical. There will be a rapture of the church. And there is a second coming when Jesus is coming back. And they are two separate events. And as you can see from the chart, the rapture is where Jesus comes to get the church. And then seven years later, the second coming is when he comes comes back to set up his kingdom with the church. So there's going to be a seven year period where we are going to be in heaven with him being prepared so that we can come back and fight that final battle with him where he puts an end to the Antichrist on the earth. So we're going to methodically go through this for just a little bit today. Like I say, there's so much more in the book, The Paradise of God, that I just can't give you today. Because if I gave you everything today that I had to give you today, we would not be having a fellowship dinner after church. We would be having a late night snack. And so uh, let's just start on this statement right here from Philippians 3.20. It says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. We need to understand that when Jesus comes back for us in the rapture of the church, and yes, it is true, the word rapture is not in the Bible, but neither is the word automobile, and I'm sure you're going to go out and get one. Your automobile, let me tell you this it actually exists although you may not think it does sometimes when it won't start but just because a word is not in the bible doesn't mean that the concept is not in the bible the word trinity is not in the bible so that doesn't mean that the father son the holy spirit don't exist as one no the concept is there and the word rapture just comes from a a latin word reparo that is in the vulgate bible that was used back in the middle ages it means that word, the actual Greek word there is harpazo. And the, the word actually means, if it were translated correctly into English, it means catching away, snatching away, taking away. So Jesus is coming back for us. And he is going to catch us away, snatch us away. He's going to take us away into heaven. And it's called the rapture as the term we use. Now, in 2 Corinthians 4.14, it says, Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Now, here's the thing. Who raised Jesus from the dead? The Father. So the Father is going to be raising us from the dead. The Scripture tells us that our mortal bodies will, they will become immortal. That our dead bodies will be resurrected. Now we also know, we know that in order to understand this, you need to grasp the reality that we are a three-part being. And all of our three parts doesn't stay together all the time. And so there's going to be a time when your body, if Jesus doesn't return soon, there's going to be a time when your body will actually die. Because Jesus Christ is coming back for the 
dead in Christ. They will be resurrected. And that's referring to your body. But your spirit and your soul will never die. When you were born again, on the day that you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's when your eternal life started. And that's talking about your spirit man, the real you. My spirit is me. And so I am already living my eternal life. At some point in time, at some point in time, Jesus is coming back for his church. And if I'm still alive when he comes back, then my living body will be caught up into the air. If my body dies before he comes back, my dead body will be caught up into the air. But either way, according to Scripture, we will be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye. That Scripture talking about the twinkling of an eye, that's, that's not talking about how fast you're going to go into space. That's talking about when you are caught up and we are all together and the body of Christ is together for the first time in history, complete. All of the, all of the born-again believers are together there in the air. Once we're caught up, because we're not going to be caught up at the same time. The Bible tells us the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, and it doesn't tell us how much time. You know, it may be just a moment. It may be some time. We, we're not told. But what we are told is the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still living, we get caught up, and we're in the air. And once we are in the air, wow, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, Corruption drops off. We take on incorruption. Mortality drops off. We take on immortality. And, as the scripture we just read says, we become as he is. We receive a body like his body. Now, we're going to read that scripture just so that you will know, and people watching online will know, that this is actually in the Bible. You know, I had a, had a gentleman write me the other day. Actually, I've had several letters on this where they said, this whole concept of the rapture that you teach is not even in the Bible. Where does it say we're going to get caught up in the air? Obviously, this guy needs a Bible to read. Uh, so let's just take a look quickly at the Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now what is that talking about right there? That God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Remember a few moments ago I said we are a three-part being? When, when our body dies, then our body goes into the ground, either in an urn or in a casket or it gets, ashes get scattered, but our body dies. But our spirit man goes to be with the Lord. The Bible even tells us that angels escort us to the presence of the Lord. Paul tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What does that mean? That means that there's a point in time on this earth before Jesus returns that there could be a separation between you and your body. Now you are living forever. You have eternal life. Your eternal life, once again, started when you received Jesus. Death is not in your future for your spirit. Death is in your past. Paul put it this way. He said, my old man, my old nature, my old spirit man was crucified with Christ. But Paul and you and me, our spirit man will never die. But our body goes into the ground. Now when Jesus returns... It says here that God will send with him those who sleep in Jesus. That means that when Jesus appears in the sky, that the Lord is going to have with him all of the spirit people in their spirit bodies who have been separated from their physical body that are Christians. So, isn't, I mean, isn't that good? See, a lot of people think that when Jesus returns, it's just going to be Jesus. No, it's going to be Jesus and, and your wife and your husband and your grandpa and your grandma and your kids. Everyone who has passed that was a born-again believer will be with him. Their bodies may be dead in the ground, but they are alive. 
Wow, this is good. And when the Bible talks about sleep in Jesus, that, that's a phrase that they used back at the time of Jesus, kind of like we say the phrase, someone passed away. Oh, what, what do we mean? It's a nice way of saying their body died. They've passed away. Well, back then they would say they sleep in Jesus. They're asleep. Okay. So, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, that's talking about their bodies, will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, and you're, if the Lord came back today, you're alive and you're remaining here on the earth, and your body and your soul and spirit will be caught up. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, uh, let's put chart number one back up for just a moment. We need to understand that when Jesus comes at the rapture, he's coming for the church. He's coming to get the church. And he does not touch down on the earth. It doesn't say he comes back to the earth and sets up his kingdom. Now see, here's the thing. At the second coming, we'll find here in a few moments, that when Jesus comes back at the second coming with his army, which is us and the angels, that what's going to happen is he's going to touch down and fulfill prophecy, and he's going to come down at the Mount of Olives. And many of you have been there with us in Israel, and, and some of you have been there on your own, you know, where, where you've been at the Mount of Olives. And just to refresh your memory, that's where the car came and hit Loretta as we were walking down the Mount of Olives and knocked his rearview mirror off. That's another story. Okay, but Jesus, Loretta, have you ever stopped to think that maybe Jesus is going to touch down right where you got hit with that car? It's possible because that's the Mount of Olives. All right. So we need to know that um, there is a time when we might say, and, and the Bible doesn't say it exactly this way, but this is kind of a way I like to think about it, that uh, when we get saved, our spirit man is born again. But our body is not. I mean, just look around at somebody sitting near you, and you can obviously tell that their body is not born again. You know, they don't have their resurrected body yet, right? But when we're caught up and we're changed and we become like him, you might say then we are completely born again at that point. Not just our spirit, man, but we, we have a resurrected body like Jesus. Wow. That scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. That's, that's going to be so good. We're going we're to be glorified. We will have a glorified body. We will no longer have a body at that point of flesh and blood. But we'll have a body of flesh and bone like Jesus. And we will have something different in our veins. Now personally, I believe that our veins are just going to be full of the glory of God. Wow. Now, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Wow. We shall be like him. Isn't that good? For we shall see him as he is. Now what happens at that point? So Jesus comes back and he catches up the church. And when he catches us up at that point, we have resurrected, glorified bodies like His. We are no longer 
just earthly humans with mortal bodies. We are immortal. And at that point, the Bible tells us that there's three things that are basically going to happen. The first thing that's going to happen is when we're taken to heaven, we're going to have the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is not judging your salvation. You've, you've already been born again. You've got your resurrected body. You're living forever. This is not to judge whether you're born again or not, but it's to give you rewards for what you have done in the flesh on earth. Now, Paul said twice he said this. He wrote in two different letters to two different churches. He said, we will all, referring to himself too, he said, we will all stand at the judgment seat of Christ and we will be judged by what we have done. Now, somebody may say, well, I thought that when I got saved, I was made righteous and all my sin was washed away. And that's true. When, when you were born again, you were made righteous, and all your sin washed away. It is no more. You are righteous. You have the righteousness of Christ. You have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You, you were made righteous. It is a gift to you. But you're not going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ on your righteousness. You're going to be judged on your holiness. And holiness and righteousness are two different things. Righteous is what you were made. It's a gift from God. It's God's gift to you. You were made righteous. Holiness is your gift to God. And that's based upon your obedience and what you have done. Now, you're not going to be at that judgment. According to Scripture, you're not going to be condemned for what you did wrong, but you will be rewarded for what you did right. And somebody may say, well, shucks, I don't want any rewards. Yes, you do. If the Lord Jesus has prepared something for you, and he knows you better than you know you, if he's prepared something for you, trust me, you are going to want it. And that's what he's done. He's, he's preparing something for each of us as a reward. So, yes, we're saved and born again and made righteous, and that means when the trumpet toots, we shoot, okay? However, when we get there, uh, Gary Stearman likes to call it our exit interview, you know, when we get there, then there's going to be crowns. The Bible talks about it several places. In fact, in, in the book that I was referring to earlier, The Paradise of God, I think I have several pages where the Scripture just talks about the rewards that we will be, that will be available for us. It's amazing. So the first thing that's going to happen is we are going to have the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the third thing that is happening while the first two things are happening is the great tribulation here on earth. Three things going on. On the earth, great tribulation. In heaven, where we are, there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ and then the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the judgment seat of Christ is preparing the bride for the marriage, adorning the bride. Now, we'll take a look at some other scriptures here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath. Now, you're going to find in the New Testament when it talks about the wrath of God to come, it's talking about the great tribulation the seven years here on earth, where Jesus pours out his wrath. Now, there's a lot of people think that all the problems are on the earth during that seven years are the Antichrist and the stormtroopers and all that. Well, yeah, they're going to be trying to take control, and they're going to be doing some really weird stuff. But the judgment on the earth is after the church is taken away, that which restrains has been taken away, then 
all that is left are those who have rejected Jesus. And Jesus pours out, read the book of Revelation, Jesus pours out his wrath onto the earth. It's not, it's not going to be a good place to be. Many people say, look, if the rapture takes place, and I see that you're all gone, then I'm going to know that what you've been telling me is true, and then I will believe. Well, that may be true. Then they will believe. But the church age ends at the rapture. That's, that's when the age of grace is over. And everyone left on the earth after the rapture will be living under the law. Now the Holy Spirit will still be here. Because there will be people drawn to Jesus. There's going to be a lot of preaching that goes on during that seven years. There's going to be 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 12,000 from each tribe. <clears throat> the Bible tells us that uh, after 1,260 days, three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to try to set up himself as God in the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff that's going to be happening. But there's going to be people who are going to say, wait a minute. This whole rapture thing happened. They may have tried to explain it away by saying that there was a mass UFO alien abduction. They, they may have tried to explain it away. But I found the books. I found a Bible. I read where this was prophesied. I, I now believe. Well, they may believe, but they're not a part of the church. And that's where Jesus said, those who endure to the end will be saved. So during the tribulation, you can still escape from hell by enduring to the end and not taking the mark of the beast and not worshiping the false prophet and the beast and all that. You can still be saved, but not born again, not be a part of the church. So what does that mean to be saved? during the tribulation. Well, you're saved from hell. And I'll read you the scripture here in just a moment where it talks about how those who endured to the end, they will be able to move into the millennial kingdom and populate the earth as humans, not as resurrected, glorified church. So I've heard Christians say, well, if the rapture takes place, they'll get it all figured out, and then they'll be a part of the church. Well, no, they may get it all figured out, but they won't be a part of the church. And in order to be saved from hell, they're going to have to resist taking the mark of the beast, and they're going to have to resist all of the trials and tribulations that are going to take place. So here's the thing. If you're born again, go. Whew. If you're not born again, get born again. Because if you're not born again and the rapture takes place, this is not cursing. I'm just going to say it. It's going to be hell on earth. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be something you don't want any of your friends and relatives, even, even the friends and relatives you don't like. <laughs> the love of God's working inside of you. And you, this will turn people into an evangelist if you can actually grasp how bad it's going to be during the Great Tribulation. So we move on to heaven. And, um, wow. Now, like I say, there's a lot of confusion in a lot of churches about the rapture and the second coming. And they take a lot of scriptures that pertain to the second coming and then they try to apply it to the rapture, and when they can't, because they don't believe in the rapture, then they say the rapture is a false doctrine. But let me give you an example. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19, it says, Your dead shall live, together with my dead body they shall live. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. 
For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. So how does that fit in with anything? Well, that's, that's out of the Old Testament. That's the prophet Isaiah. He's talking to the Jews. And he's telling them, you're going to have to hang out until all this indignation, until all of this tribulation has passed, and then your dead bodies are going to be raised. See, now, if you understand Scripture properly, you'll understand that there will be a resurrection for the Jews. But the resurrection for the Jews is at the end of the tribulation. And it's not any scripture that you find in the Old Testament about the resurrection of the Jews. And you try to apply that to the church, it just doesn't fit. But if you can understand the scriptures that are talking about the Jews and the scriptures that are talking about the church, all right, and separate the rapture from the second coming and understand the tribulation and the revelation plus the books of Zechariah and Isaiah and Ezekiel, then you're going to find that all of it fits together seamlessly. Now, there's a lot of anti-Semitism in the world. And there's a lot of people that hate the Jews. And because of that, there's a lot of churches that won't even res recognize that there will be a resurrection of the Jews. Now, are the Jews going to be the church? No, they are not going to be the church. We are the church. The church is a separate group. It's, it's the body of Christ. There is a window of time of two days, of 2,000 years, starting when Jesus put his blood on the mercy seat in Hebrews to the time he comes back together the church. That's the church age. That's the age of grace. That's the age where if we believe in him, we're saved. And that's the age where those who believe in him receive glorified bodies. We're caught up in the rapture. But when the rapture takes place, that group is sealed. And there's even a place in the scriptures where it talks about how we are the, the trophies of his grace. Throughout all eternity, if anybody ever says, accuses God or Jesus of not having grace, he can point to the church and say, see that group of knuckleheads? They were joint heirs with my son. I made them joint heirs. And they didn't do You talk about grace? Let me show you my grace. They were in sin. And just by believing in my son, I cleansed all their sin. And we become the trophy of his grace. That's what the church becomes. The trophy of his grace. I mean, even, even when man was created, angels looked on and they said, who is this man that you're mindful of him? God has had a special place in his heart for mankind, for the church. He created us in his image and likeness so that we would, his image and likeness, that means so we'd look like and act like him. He, want, he wants to fellowship with us. Hmm. Wow. Boy, do I have so much more to give you than I know we can get to today. Hmm. Well, you know, 2 Timothy uh, 4.8, Paul said, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Colossians 2.18 says, let no one cheat you out of your reward. Don't let somebody trick you into sinning, trick you out of your reward. Don't do that. 1 Corinthians 3.8 says, each one of us will have our own reward. I mean, there's a lot to look forward to right after the rapture. The judgment seat of Christ is going to be fun. It's going to be like a reward ceremony at college. You remember college? Do you remember high school? Do you remember your science class? Maybe that wasn't a good illustration. Hmm. Well, 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, it talks about how we become the righteousness of God in Him. God loves us. And this being a part of the church is a very special group. Very special group. Now, I know I opened up a can of worms a few moments ago. I saw it on your faces when, when I said about the resurrection of the Jews. But we'll get to that here in a second. Now, the marriage supper of the Lamb that takes place in heaven, that is when we 
I believe, are brought together with Jesus and we are given the robes of righteousness and we are being trained during that time on how to rule and reign for a thousand years when we come back to the earth. Now, we're not just going to be in heaven playing solitaire on some kind of holy Xbox, and, uh, and then all of a sudden Jesus says, well, it's time to go, and so we all hop on our white horses and head back to earth, and now he's going to say, okay, rule and reign for a thousand years. Duh, how do we do that? You know, there's, there's got to be some, a time of training. And I believe that the Scripture tells us that during this seven years in heaven, when we receive the rewards and we have the marriage supper of the Lamb, that's the time where the bride is, is made ready. And the Bible talks about that in Revelation, we're made ready to return. All right? Let me give you some interesting facts about the Jewish wedding customs at the time of Jesus. The, uh, it, it involved three things. The first thing was there's a dowry that was given to the, to the bride or to the family. And the second thing was a year later, the bridegroom and all of his male friends would show up unexpectedly slash expectedly at the bride's house to take her away to the groom's father's house where they had added a room or a dwelling place there for him and his new bride. And so that's kind of like what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 14. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. You know, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and get you. Now, we're supposed to be ready. The Bible says we're supposed to be ready. We know he's coming back. We know approximately when he's coming back. We don't know the exact day. But the bride had to be ready all the time. I mean, every night when she got ready for bed, she, she got ready for the groom to show up and take her away. We need to be ready. Wow, this is good. Well, you know, in John chapter 17, Jesus was praying to the Father. And I call John chapter 17, I call it the real Lord's Prayer. He said, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me, that where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. And it goes, he goes on and on there in that, in that prayer, but he, he talks about how much he loves us and he wants to be with us. You know, the Bible says husbands love your wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. I mean, there's an example right there of, of the marriage that he is wanting to take place in the realm of the Spirit. In the same way that husbands love their wives, Christ, that's how he loves the church. Now, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus returns with the church. If we could put chart number one back up again. You really need to get this deep down inside of you. At the rapture of the church, Jesus comes for the saints. At the second coming, he comes back to earth with the saints. At the rapture, we're caught up into the air with him. At the second coming, we come back on white horses with him to the earth. Now, in Matthew 27, 24, 27, it says, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, I, I can only touch on this because it would just take two sermons to explain it all. But many times when Jesus is talking with his disciples and he's giving an account of what's going to take place in the end of days, a lot of people use those things to talk about what's going to happen before the rapture. But his disciples were not asking him what's going to take place before the rapture because they did not know about the rapture. They did not know about the church. At the time Jesus was talking to them, there was not one single born-again believer on the face of the earth. The church had not even come into existence yet. What they were asking him was, when are you 
as it's prophesied in Zechariah and Ezekiel and Daniel, when are you going to, if you are really the Messiah, when are you going to set up your kingdom? That's what they wanted to know. When are you going to set up your kingdom? And Jesus talks about these things. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be this and that. And, and he talks about all these things. And he says, and, and the end isn't quite yet. you know. And that's where he says, those who endure to the end will be saved. He's talking to Jews about what the Jews are going to be going through and what's going to happen when he sets up his kingdom. Well, he sets up his kingdom at the end of the tribulation when he returns at the second coming. When he touches down, that's when he starts setting up his kingdom. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the rapture of the church. Now granted, we may see a precursor of some of these things. We may see an increase of earthquakes. We may see rumors of wars. And, but nothing like what they're going to have during the tribulation. All right? Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation. Did you catch that? Immediately after the tribulation. John 24, 29. Of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is why it gets confusing with people. He's talking about the second coming here. It doesn't say he's coming and he's going to gather the elect. And, and I can take you through a teaching, and we've done it before, of the Greek word and everything there. That's, that's those who are called. That, that's talking about the church. So he's going to gather together his elect from the four winds, from, the, from one end of heaven to the other. Well, how can that happen at the rapture, because we're here. There has to be the second coming, because we're there. So he's gathering together his saints in heaven to return to the earth. Wow. Ah, remember, they're like bookends on a bookshelf. The rapture and the second coming. We have the seven-year tribulation. Just picture seven books in between there. We have the seven-year tribulation between the two bookends. All of it is the end of days. Now, the day of the Lord, I'm just going to briefly mention this. There are several days of the Lord in the Bible. But many times, and most of the time, when it's talking about the day of the Lord that's going to come, it's talking about the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ when he's going to rule and reign with the church for 1,000 years. Remember, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it says that one day with the Lord is 1,000 years and 1,000 years is one day. And then when it talks about the day of the Lord, it's talking about his day. When he comes back, he sets up his kingdom and he has his day. And he rules and reigns on this earth for that full day, for a full 1,000 years. Hmm. Matthew 24, 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Wow, it's, it's interesting. This is interesting. Hmm. Well, see, um, Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 4, it says, On that day he will stand, on the Mount of Olives. <sighs> well, you know, when Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation with us, the Antichrist is really going to do his best to just destroy everything that God loves. He's a loser. But, you know, the, the Bible says that when Jesus returns, he, uh, he kills them with a sharp sword. Well, what is the sword? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All he has to do is just say, you're toast, and they're done. Wow. 
Well, again, Satan is defeated by the Word of God. Let me uh, give you some scripture here. Revelation 19.11 Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Now, let me say this. At the beginning of the book of Revelation, there's a door open. And I believe that this is kind of showing us a template. There's a door open, and John is caught up. There's a door open, and John is caught up. Now, at the end of Revelation, there's a door opened, and the church comes out of it. Wow, what a coincidence. Okay, not a coincidence, prophetic. Now, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Boy, there's a story about that, about how uh, they would put blood on a prayer shawl of Jews who were... It's another story. Don't have time. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called... What is his name? The Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now you're going to find that the church, previously if you read here in Revelation, we are the ones clothed in fine linen. That's us. Wow. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth came a sharp sword. Say, what is the sword? It's, the, it's his word. It's the word of God. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepresses of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let me clear up something. It's not a tattoo. I can prove it from Scripture, but we just don't have time to get into it right now. But uh, a Jew would not take a tattoo. All right. Revelation 19.19. 19. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So the kings of the earth are not just going to come against him on his white horse. They're coming against the church, us, on our white horses also. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on about the mark of the beast right now. There's a lot of YouTube videos you can watch. And, you know, is an implant the mark of the beast? Is it? Now, listen, the mark of the beast is not going to happen until the tribulation. So you, you may have a mark. Well, there's a mark over there. You, you may have a mark. You may have an implant. You may have a vaccination. But whatever it is, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying this. It's not the mark of the beast. Because the mark of the beast is not going to take place until the Antichrist puts it forth during the tribulation. All right. All right, let's read that again. Um, the beast, then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in, the pres, in, their, in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. When he comes back, he is going to annihilate the kingdom of the Antichrist that he tried to set up completely. Revelation 21, 20 verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, he laid hold of the dragon. Now, now, follow this. 
It's talking about Satan. The dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. This is when Satan is bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. Of course, he's released at the end of the millennium, and we're not going into that today. But keep this in mind. The dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan are all the same. All right. Now, resurrection of the faithful Jews. When Jesus comes back and uh, there's a great earthquake and, and uh, he touches down, it says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as was never seen since there was a nation, even to that end. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is Daniel prophesying to Israel. He's not prophesying to the church. He's prophesying to Israel. And it, once again, after the time of great tribulation is over, then there will be a resurrection of the Jews. Now, someone may say, well, does that mean they're a part of the church? No, no, no. Just rewind back to the beginning of what we were talking about here. The church is a sealed group. These, this resurrection at the end of the tribulation, those who are resurrected there will be resurrected and brought back to life in human bodies. All right? Now the church will be ruling and reigning out of the heavenly Jerusalem. Not the new Jerusalem. It doesn't show up for another thousand years. But we'll be ruling and reigning out of the heavenly Jerusalem. It's my belief that the Jews, the righteous Jews, will be ruling and reigning out of the earthly Jerusalem because there will be a dual kingdom going on here. And we're ruling over the earth for a thousand years. Now, when the church, and this is going beyond where I wanted to go today, but the church, when we rule and reign for a thousand years, we will be ruling and reigning in resurrected, glorified bodies that will be like the body Jesus has where we can appear and move at the speed of thought. Gravity doesn't affect us, and we don't have to have oxygen because we can, we can go to heaven, we can come to earth, we can go wherever we want to go. The people who are resurrected into human bodies, the people who have survived and endured to the end through the tribulation, those people are still in their human bodies. Being in human bodies and not having the Holy Spirit living inside of them because they are not the church, they are still subject to the law and human nature. Now, I want to read something to you out of the Message Bible that I think says this very clear. One of the things that's going to happen, all the people, all the nations on the earth, after the tribulation is over, Jesus is going to sit on a throne and he's going to bring all of these people to him. The nations and the people. And nations will be judged and people will be judged. And it says in Matthew 25, verse 31, the Son of Man will take his place on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him and he will sort the people out much as a shepherd sorts out sheep and goats, putting sheep to his right and goats to his left. And then verse 41 in the New King James, Then he will say to those on his left, on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So at the end of the tribulation, of course, the Antichrist and his army, they're going to be wiped out. But then all of those people who survived the tribulation, some of them survived because they took the mark of the beast. And they were able to buy and sell and live the good life. Some people endured. Some people hid. The Bible even talks about there's, the Jews are going to be hidden away in, 
in a place in Judea. It's, it's really an interesting story about all of this. But uh, all of them will be brought before Jesus and the, the nations. And the nations will be judged based upon whether they supported the Messiah or not. And in the millennium, there will be some nations that won't exist. There will be many nations that you may not think would exist will. The Bible even tells us uh, in Zechariah that the, the nation of Egypt is in the millennium. Go figure. Well, that must mean that during the tribulation, the nation of Egypt decided they weren't going to come against Israel. They weren't going to side with the Antichrist. So that nation continues on. And then each individual person... Did you take the mark of the beast? You're on the left side. Uh, you endured to the end and you believe that Jesus was the Messiah? Okay, you're on the right hand. And though all those on the left, left they're, they're cast out. The ones on the right, what happens to them? They move into the millennial kingdom and in their physical bodies replenish the earth. Wow. Well, the result is that the millennial kingdom on earth will be inhabited by tribulation saints and righteous Jews who believed that Jesus was the, was the Messiah, and they blessed the Jews instead of cursing the Jews during the tribulation. And you need to know this, the rapture and the second coming are two separate events that take place seven years apart. Now there are some people that believe that the rapture is going to take place mid-tribulation. And they get that from... Uh, the Bible talking about 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. Uh, but that's, in, in context, that's talking about how long it is before the Antichrist decides to set himself up. So there's going to be three and a half years where he's, so, so to speak, making his move and convincing the population. And the population, trust me, the population can be convinced pretty easy. Because most people operate in fear, you know. And uh, I would like to go into that very deep right at the moment. But uh, I don't want to get off subject here. All right, so Angie, video department, or Alicia. Or the red-headed tall boy. <laughs> let's, put, let's put the graphic up once again. Yeah, let's put this one up. Okay, this graphic is in the back of the book, The Paradise of God. And it will show you and give you some scriptural reference so you can visualize how there's going to be a time when the church is taken up in a tribulation and then the church is brought back. Your eternal life has already started. Your best days are yet to come. No matter what happens in your life, your future is bright because you are the church. And there will be a time when the Lord points at you and says, this is a trophy of my grace. Wow. Okay, let's put the other graphic up for just a moment. Right there. The rapture and the second coming. The rapture is when Jesus comes for his church. Then we have seven years, and the second coming is when Jesus comes with his church to defeat the Antichrist and set up his millennial kingdom. Wow, I feel like I just ran a, a mile relay. You get <laughs> so, let's stand. I'm going to ask the altar ministers to come forward right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you the praise. We thank you, Father. I speak the blessing upon these, your people. Comfort them. Reveal your word to us in abundance and in depth. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Amen.